Hi, I'm Craig. Welcome to the Libro FM podcast, where we talk to authors, narrators, booksellers, and more. And I'm Karen, and we are very happy to be back this month with an episode where we got to sit down with Neil Patel, who is an author and screenwriter based out of Los Angeles. And Neil's debut novel, Tell Me How to Be, was released last year, and that was following his book of short stories, which is called If You See Me, Don't Say Hi. I loved both of these books. Um, I actually listened to Tell Me How to Be last Christmas, like right around the holiday season. Um, we had rented like a house down the Cape. Um in Massachusetts. And I was like, went for a walk by myself, like with my AirPods on. I was like listening to it, like walking down the beach in the winter. It was a, it was a whole moment. So when we That's decided lovely. to start this, <laughs> it was lovely. It was really nice. The, the, the beach, the beach when there's like snow on it is like a weird thing that I enjoy. So when we decided that we were going to do this podcast and we were kind of like brainstorming who we were going to have on it, Neil immediately jumped into my head as someone that I, I wanted to talk to because I loved the book so much. And then I, I also then read the short stories. Um, those I only just read though, when we, when we, Neil said yes to doing the podcast, like, um, <laughs> but loved both. Well, I'm so glad that you introduced me to Neil Patel's work because I had not read either of these books yet. And I loved them both. I could not put them down. Unlike you, I started with the short stories because I love short stories with all of my heart and then moved on to the novel. Loved that as well. And I need to know from the author, Neil Patel, when the next book is coming out because I need more of his words in my life, Craig. <laughs> well, luckily we're recording this intro after we recorded the podcast. <laughs> And I know for a fact that he's going to answer your question. So, <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's like you're predicting the future. I love it. <laughs> yes, I am a psychic. No, I really enjoyed doing this episode too. It was, it was fun to talk with Neil and I feel like he was so casual and easy to talk to. Um, and I'm glad that we did the lightning round thing again. It was fun oh, with Anne yes. and it was also fun with Neil. So I think we're just going to have to make this part of each episode moving forward. I agree. I, I do feel like in round two, our questions are getting increasingly strange. So I'm excited. I was going to say silly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we talk about teeth disintegrating. It's disgusting. So it's a, a recurring dreams, Craig. We weren't <laughs> <laughs> get it right. <laughs> well, if that sounds interesting to you, keep listening to the rest of the episode. Before we get into the interview, we wanted to play a clip from Neil's 2021 novel, Tell Me How to Be. We hope you enjoy the clip and then the interview will come right after it. I would not have chosen to live in this town with its quiet roads and its dark winters, but back then, I didn't have much of a choice. I married Ashok. He brought me to Illinois. There was no alternative. I could not have been what the whites call a spinster, drinking martinis at 3 p.m. According to my parents... Women like those were failures. They were dangerous. But what's so wrong with a dangerous woman? Women have choices now. What to wear, whom to marry, even whether to be a woman at all. It's all fine with me, as long as everyone shaves their legs. I didn't choose this life for myself, but now I'm choosing to leave it. Welcome to the podcast, Neil. Both Karen and I have been super excited to have you. We are both fresh off a read of both your short story collection and your novel. Um, so we were both just reading it and like texting each other nonstop, like, oh my God, I can't believe this happened and back and forth. So um, we both really, really liked it. Yes, I specifically love short stories, uh, which Craig hears me talk about all the time. And so uh, I was carrying around, if you see me, don't say hi, like in my purse, in my backpack. It's like all banged up and dog-deared. I just loved it. So I can't wait to ask you lots of questions about that one too. <laughs> yeah. I love that you love short stories. I feel like more people need to love short stories. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm, try I'm trying to spread the good word. They are my favorite. <laughs> I like short stories at the end of the year when I'm trying to hit my reading goal. I like a nice, you know, shorter, you know, got to yeah. hit those numbers, you know. So during our little intro that we recorded, we gave a little bit of information about you, um, you know, as we were kind of teeing up the episode. But for folks who may not be familiar with their work, we'd love if you could just give a, a kind of like brief synopsis about yourself. Um, yeah, I'm Neil Patel, obviously. <laughs> and um, 
I'm a writer from Champaign, Illinois. I grew up in a small Midwestern town and then I moved to Los Angeles and I first started writing short stories and kind of publishing them in little journals. And that led to a two book deal. Um, the first of which is a collection of stories called If You See Me, Don't Say Hi. And the second of which is a novel called Tell Me How to Be. And I prim primarily write through the perspective of second generation South Asian Americans. Um, I write about love and family and relationships and ambition and what it's like to be brown in America and to be the child of immigrant parents and also about the queer experience on top of that. Awesome. Well, kind of diving right into it, I have a question that seems very minute, but <laughs> there was a clue I feel like I found um, in the acknowledgments of if you see me, don't say hi. I always read the acknowledgments and um, you had a note there to your editor that said, thank you for plucking me out of the slush pile. And I felt like this was a little like secret insight into kind of like what your experience has been like as you... Um, started out on this journey with the short story collection than with a novel. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that, you know, with the slush pile, what does that mean? What happened and, and how did you get to where you are? Yeah. So the slush pile is basically a pile of like unsolicited manuscripts that no one asked for. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so that was actually, I think that was to my agent because I had submitted to her um, I just emailed her and um, she had actually told me after she signed me that most of her clients come through referrals, you know, through MFA programs or through editors and things of that nature. Um, so I just sort of like blindly emailed people my manuscript, but I think I chose the perfect time to do it. It was, I believe, two days after Trump won the election in 2016. And um, I kind of realized like, okay, it's like now or never. Um, and I remembered feeling, you know, when he won, I felt this kind of fear and I was feeling, feeling these things like, what is it gonna be like for me as a Brown person? What is it gonna be, be like for my parents who are still living in this small Midwestern town? And then on top of that, being queer. And I remember I had this moment where I was like, oh my God, maybe I shouldn't have come out of the closet, you know? And when I thought that, I was like, no, 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 <laughs> you can't go to that place. And, and that really motivated me to go out. And so I, I sent my manuscript out and she was one of the people who, who read and responded to it. So, yeah. so that's insane to me, like just sending that email. Cause I'm sure she gets like a million emails, just like any other literary agent. D did you ever ask her like, what, like what stuck out in like, she pops open Gmail and like decides to open this one and move forward. Like what? I think it was that I made it very personal. Um, and I wrote it in my voice. I think some people have a tendency to be very formal and like business like, but this is the art world and like people don't really care about that. <laughs> um, and it's, it's funny you bring that up because I don't really remember specifically what I said, but apparently she said that my, my query letter was like, so good that she like uses it as an example when she like oh, wow. a program <laughs> nice. and students and stuff. And I was like, Oh, wow. <laughs> um, but I think I must've just been very honest. And I've obviously I talked about my background and um, why I think stories like these are important and the lack of representation, um, both in the sense of like queer stories and stories about, you know, immigrants and children of immigrants. And so I think she responded to that. You had mentioned that you signed a two book deal. Was the plan always to be one short stories collection, one novel, or did that just kind of organically happen because you were writing short stories? Yeah, I think that the plan was always to do, do a, a novel as a follow up. And that's kind of like an industry standard in a way. Um, most publishers aren't super thrilled to just publish a collection of stories because they don't really pull in the numbers that novels do. Um, but if you can kind of promise that you will have a novel following it up, then, then they're more excited about it. And they look at it then as like they're discovering a new voice who can go on to write tons of books for them. Um, so yeah, I think I, I, I just, I wrote 50 pages of a novel. And so they, they read that and then sign me up. They were hooked. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, those 50 pages, I don't even think made it into the, the, the actual book. 
Maybe you can turn them into a short story. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Send them to me. I want to read them. I want to read more of your words. Um, I have a lot of questions about themes across both of your works. Um, but before I go too far down that path, um, there were some similarities that we noticed thematically across the two. And one of the things that Craig and I wanted to ask you was, you know, as you wrote the short stories, did some of those themes inform then the arc of the novel? Um, did they, was that interplay in your mind as you were, as you were writing the the first book? Yeah. Um, well, I think after I wrote it and I stepped back from it, I realized that there I feel like with, if you see me, don't say hi, it's interesting. I feel like you can create different novels from just that collection because there's so many, like there are some stories that are more traditional and they're more family oriented stories. And then there are other stories that are just kind of like out there and they're about like crazy people um, (laughs) going against the grain um, of society. Um, And so I think that kind of, I think there were two stories at the end that were very like emotional and, um, and then I think the title story that was more emotional, I kind of tapped more into that um, when writing the novel. And I, it's funny, when I first started the collection, the first story I wrote was a story called These Things Happen, which is like really kind of bizarre story. And then the <laughs> last two, three stories were the title story and the two stories at the end, which were more kind of like, I don't know, I felt like I was getting closer to the core of my experience. I started, I started doing stories that were a little bit more out there. And then I came closer and closer and closer to who I was and what my experience was as a child and, and just, you know, my family. And, and so that became the inspiration for, for the novel. I, oh my gosh, I, that's really powerful to hear and to like, to have that insight into where you were as you were writing those. And, um, a couple of the themes that I was referring to that were just like very top of mind for me reading these, um, they just have stuck stuck with me <laughs> for weeks after this. Um, the first one that I wanted to ask you about was this idea of like characters that aren't there. There's this absent you frequently that somebody is writing towards or referring to, um, yearning for. And even though they're not on screen, <laughs> I'm putting that in air quotes, these off screen <laughs> characters are just as important as the the people who are narrating and speaking. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, about how that came to be um, and why that's so important across both of these books. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of my work is about longing, I realize. And I think as somebody who was kind of on the outside of things, I was always longing to be inside. I was always longing for companionship, for friendship, for love and growing up because I was I came of age in the 80s and 90s. And so being queer, you know, no one was really out of the closet, especially in a small town. And then on top of that, being the only brown kid in class, I was often like, overlooked or recognized for like the wrong things for being like an outcast or for not fitting in. And so I think that writing in that kind of you form is my way of addressing, I don't know, like this collective audience that I wanted to connect with that I never could. I, that makes a ton of sense. And and especially in terms of the next question I wanted to ask you about, um, but this idea of how, sort of different versions of ourselves collide with each other um, based on the situation that we're in. Um, And so a lot of that yearning also showed up for me with um, like Akash in the back of his mom's car when he goes home um, and they're driving past the gay bar and Mm -hmm. comments are made in his presence. Um, Just the idea of returning home in general, reconnecting with a former love. Um, And so in a, in an interesting way, it's kind of like, uh, these timelines that are stacked on top of each other. Like here's the memories that I have from the last time I was here with who I am now and how these are intersecting with each other. Um, is this, is this still something that you think about? I know you're doing different kinds of work now, uh, which we'll ask you about later, but is this still <laughs> kind of central to, to what you're, what you're playing with in your writing? Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't know. I think a lot about the past. Um, I'm one of those people who's like, I'm really nosy on Facebook and I want to know like, all the people <laughs> I went to high school with. Like, That's a theme that I saw in the, in the books a little bit too. Yeah, like yeah. Facebook, 
<laughs> sleuthing. Yeah. All the things that, like my high school classmates are doing. And it's funny, like now that I have a couple books and like certain things have happened, like I'll get like messages from like popular kids from my high school who are like, oh, that's so cool. And I was telling a friend, I was like, isn't it sad that like it still makes me feel like, oh, wow, like this person <laughs> thinks I'm cool, you know, <laughs> so many years later. But I mean, I think that's how powerful the past is. I, I, I tell people who we are in high school is who we are in life. We just get better at hiding it. And mm-hmm. so like the insecure people are always going to be insecure no matter how beautiful or rich or powerful they may become in their life. Um, you know, the assholes are probably always going to be assholes. <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> Just in different versions. In different versions. Do you um, just respond to the Facebook messages telling them if they see you not to say hi? I know. Or to, yeah. <laughs> I know. I try to like play it cool. So I don't want to like do too much. Like, oh, cool. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, um when we were prepping for this podcast and any podcast we do with an author, we tend to watch and listen to other interviews they have done recently. Like one, just it's good research, but two, we want to make sure we don't ask the same questions a million times. And I think you did an interview recently with a, I don't know if they're a podcast or just a website, but there are books and beyond. And I, I apologize if I'm butchering this, but I'll, I'll paraphrase. You said something like, you know, one of the reasons you wanted to write these books is that when you were growing up, you didn't have a book that was anything like this. And that if you did have a book like this, um, you know, in your small town, et cetera, like it really could have helped you. Mm-hmm. And I guess I was just curious, like what was that like process of re- like, like writing that book that you wish you had as a, as a kid? Well, I really, yeah, I, I wanted to kind of, um, what's interesting is that for tell me how to be, especially I remembered watching, um, I lo- um, love Simon, the movie love Simon. And I had this really strong emotional reaction to it. And it wasn't even just the movie or the performances or anything. It was just this realization that like, I'll never have what Simon has at his age because it's too late. And that's a part of my life that I was robbed of and that I missed out on. And I can never, I can't go back in time and come out at 16 and have a boyfriend and, and a, you know, uh, a date to a, a school dance and everything. Um, and so I thought, well, if I can't have it, then I'm going to write it for myself. And I was like, well, I want to write a love story, even though it wasn't always like happy. Um, (laughs) (laughs) To put it lightly, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I thought, you know, I thought, so it wasn't even that I was so concerned necessarily about, oh, let me give this to someone else who didn't have it. It was kind of selfish. It's like, well, I want it for myself. You know, I want to write a book that I would have wanted to read. Um, And that's kind of where it started. So, and are we correct that you are now writing for film and television? Is that kind of where your where your time is now? Yeah, I'm sort of developing. I have a couple of projects in development. Um, one was based on the book, um, and one is like a feature film that it's. I, I wrote a script, and we're working on getting it filmed. Hopefully next summer. Or so. Oh my gosh. So okay, two follow up questions with the <laughs> with the the feature film. Um, what has that been like to be working on kind of someone else's project versus like the very deeply personal stuff you've been working on the last several years? Yeah, it's, it's definitely an adjustment, but I actually like, I like doing it because, um, I don't know, it takes the pressure off. Like when you have Mm. other people involved, cause it's like, okay, if this bombs, it's not my fault. (laughs) (laughs) But like, (laughs) that's one of the things actually that I love about TV and film, film, um, especially with TV is that like, you can, you can go right on someone else's show. And if everybody hates it, well, you know, you're not the star of the show, (laughs) you know, but like when you put out a book, it's all you, like, no one's going to, point the finger at your editor or somebody else. Like it's just it's yeah. all your agent. It's really all you. You're the face of this project. So there is a lot of pressure. So I actually welcome that where I think a lot of fiction writers are so precious about their work. And so, you know, they couldn't do that. I actually yep. like it. So, so you said one of the projects is based off your, off your book with off of um, tell me how to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like a TV adaptation. Um, yeah. So that's you're, how you're acting very nonchalant about what seems like amazing <laughs> news. <laughs> you know why? Because, um, I think I'm at that place now where, so like I adapted, I was adapting my first book. If you see me, don't say hi for, um, AMC network, 
which was like super exciting. Like they do like Breaking Bad and like Walking Dead and all this stuff. So like, why do they want to do this? But they wanted to <laughs> right in. So I was writing the pilot and everything. It was my first pilot. And I was like, yes, this is definitely going to be a show. And and um, I was like very naive. And the thing is in Hollywood, <laughs> like stuff is in development all the time. Doesn't mm-hmm. always mean it's going to happen. So now I'm at the place where I'm like, okay, let's just like do this and see what happens. Gotcha. Um, but if, if I was talking to you like three years ago, I would have been like, my head would have been in the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> Every, any author we've spoken to who has some sort of TV adaptation or film adaptation has basically said exactly what you said yep. is that it's so slow and it yeah. sometimes doesn't happen. And like, yeah. so I'm sure this one will though. Yes. And I'm super excited to watch it when it, when it comes yeah. out. Yes. <laughs> um, we should ask about audiobooks. <laughs> this is yes. the point in the podcast where <laughs> Craig and I typically get in trouble with the people we're interviewing they're like don't you work at an audiobook company do you want to ask me about that <laughs> yeah we have been lambasted on like the last two episodes <laughs> and and patch it that had she was like well, you got to ask about audiobooks <laughs> yeah um so moving into audiobooks for we'll we'll start with your audiobooks obviously so we we um Karen and I, I think we both had the paper books and the audio and kind of were flipping back and forth between them, you know, depending on what we were doing during the day. Um, and one thing we've heard from both narrators who are just professional narrators and then also authors who narrate their own work is that it can be very grueling to sit there in the booth, you know, hour after hour doing take after take. And I, I just, I'd love to hear about what that process was like for you. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, so yeah, I narrated the first the first book, If You See Me Don't Say Hi, and they had me go to like a studio. It was like two days and they were like eight hour days. Like I felt like I had like a job. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and it was, yeah, it was very grueling because, you know, those microphones are so sensitive too. And they like pick up, they're like, oh, you sound hungry. <laughs> and you're like, not the first, you're not the first person to mention that to us, by the way. Oh, really? That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like they're like your stomach's making noise. I was like, okay, well. <laughs> so um, yeah, like they, it picks up everything, and then you have to like redo lines sometimes, and mm. it's just it's really strenuous. It, it, like I, I have mad respect for like people who narrate anything or do voiceover acting. It's really hard. You know? Yeah. So is the fact that it was so grueling is that why you didn't do the second book or is it I just was, because yeah. well you know what's oh sorry funny did i steal your question karen i was gonna ask the same thing <laughs> <laughs> well what's funny is they didn't actually even ask me so i'm like oh did i do like a really terrible job <laughs> no i think what they i think i think they just generally i think they have unless you want to do it maybe i think they have like professional people do it i think because the the novel was a bigger book maybe they're like okay let's spend money and like have like yeah somebody else do it and um i actually haven't listened to that yet but i've heard such amazing things about tell me how to be's audiobook and the narrator of the class adam did a really good job um i did hear a little bit of it and so many people were surprised that it was one person doing both yeah yeah I had that reaction too. I think I said something to Craig about it. I'm like, oh, there were two narrators for this one. And he said, no, no, there are not. Uh-huh. <laughs> I had to go back and look. <laughs> it's crazy. Like sometimes like the the talent that it takes to do that, different accents mm-hmm. and like different tone of voice and everything. And it's just, for someone who has listened to it, it did come out really well, by the way, you should listen to it. Um, yeah, I want to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know an app where you could download it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I have uh, one more question about your novel that I would love to ask um, as we, I just keep looking at the time, but we have a million questions for you. But um, one of the quotes that has stuck with me is when Akash says, um, you know, hate is a self-inflicted wound. And I feel like that's so simple and true, but it also very much complicates how we have understood that character who has gone through um, so much like directly targeted hate uh, throughout his life. and. I was reading something or or maybe listening to an interview with you where you talk about the process of writing this. Obviously, the pandemic has been with us. Um, There was quarantine, there was lockdown, and you were writing these really challenging things from a place of isolation about someone who feels very isolated. Um, So I was wondering if you could share any any thoughts on what that was like for you, um, because I can't imagine the difficulty of even creating anything (laughs) during that time period. (laughs) 
yeah, there was this kind of like underlying just sense of doom, you know, yeah. at one point I was like, what's the point of even doing this? Like, will we even survive this? Yep. And, you know, that one point it was like really bad where, I mean, I wasn't even leaving my apartment to do anything. I was getting things delivered. And like, <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was hard, but I think like, if anything, I just needed something to live for and something to do. And so I kind of, I don't know, I just kind of fell into it. And then there was this period where the lockdown, at least in LA, kind of ended for like a week. And as soon as it ended, I was like, I'm going to my hometown. And I ended up staying there for several months, writing the bulk of this book. And I think that really helped me to be back in this place that I had such complicated emotions about. Because on one hand, it was home. And then on the other hand, it was the, the place where so much happened to me, you know? Um, and I don't know, it was really, this was actually, and I don't know if I mentioned this in another interview, but like um, my parents put the house, they put their house on the market. And that was what also inspired this book because I was mm. suddenly being told, oh, you should come home and like pack up all your things. And I had a very like, my house was very special to me because it was the only place that felt safe. Like I remember on weekends, just really looking forward to the weekend, not because I was going to go hang out with my friends and have a good time, but because I hated school so much because I was so scared to go to school every day. Mm. So like, in fact, I didn't even like going to the mall sometimes because I would run into kids from school and I was scared of what they might say to me or do to me. So like, I was always home and I just associated home with being like safe. So to be there and to write the book and confront these dark themes, like I had that kind of sense of security because I was in my childhood home. Do you think the book would have come out differently if you ended if you would have just stayed in LA during that period? I mean, I'm assuming like be like you said, being home was such a powerful part of that experience. Mm -hmm. Like, do you think you could have written the book the way you did if you didn't go home? No, I don't think so. I wow. think, yeah, I think I had to be there. And I had to like see everything and experience everything and remember all of these things. It wasn't even necessarily like the book isn't super autobiographical, but it's like just the feeling behind it. You know, I wouldn't have had that feeling in LA. Yeah. 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 Did you unearth anything interesting or funny that you can share with us as you were cleaning out your <laughs> childhood belongings? <laughs> <laughs> Karen, lightening the mood. I, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I was, yeah. I was, <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, it's funny because when my parents had told me about this, um, the all the only thing I could think of was like, oh my God, I think I have like dirty, porny stuff. Like <laughs> in, my, in this one briefcase, I remember it was this briefcase and I How put fancy you put you, you put your childhood <laughs> in a <laughs> no, briefcase. Like, well, because it had a lock on it. So like it, it was like a combination <laughs> lock. So I was like, okay, well, they'll never find it in here. Um, and so like I put that briefcase on my shelf and I was like, oh my God. And um, that was where my mind went also, like so many decades later, it was like, That's amazing. To get to this. so yeah, like it was funny to see what kind of stuff I was printing off the internet. Like this was during the days of like dial up internet, like, <laughs> P like pic pixelated, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So was it, was it there? Did you, did you rescue it before prying it eyes there. got to it? <laughs> it was there. It was like in the pocket in the briefcase. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad I sporadically asked that question <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh man so i think we alluded to this in the beginning but we've been doing this little lightning round thing where we we ask some kind of sillier questions which we kind of already have started which is fun <laughs> um but before we get into those we did want to ask you what you are working on um i see like you mentioned you're at your parents house so are you writing another book um yeah. but yeah we'd love to know what you're working on right now um either you know um, short stories, books, TV, whatever. Yeah. So yeah, I have this, that film is kind of in development I'm not, my part is done. Um, and then I'm doing another book. So I'm actually finishing it. I'm hoping to be done in the next week or so. Um, and that's definitely a departure from like, tell me how to be. Um, but in a way it's kind of like inspired by some of the stories. And if you see me, don't say hi, there were these stories about these, these kind of darker stories about these women, um, that were kind of like edgier and kind of funny. And, um, so yeah, it's like a darkly comic psychological thriller. Um, nice. so yeah, it's funny, but it's, it's kind of like HBO's Barry, 
but like with a little bit of Otessa Moshbag in there because she's really funny. She's like really wickedly funny and I'm a big fan of her. So yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. What's the, I mean, I know you're still writing it. So the timeline is probably pretty squishy right now, but do you have like a rough idea of when you're hoping this will be out? Um, yeah, I mean, it would probably be a while because, so I'm actually out of contract. So I'm like a free agent now. So we, we're going to sell it probably to my publishers, but we'll see. But yeah, at that point, it would probably be a year after that. So maybe like a okay. year or so. Yeah. Are you going to do the audiobook? <laughs> oh, actually, no, I don't think. <laughs> you're like, I had enough of that the first yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. Your, your stomach is growling. You're like, never mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Um, so getting into our fun little, or hopefully fun, <laughs> um, lightning round questions. Um, our first one is, is a little bit still about the books. Um, so music played a massive role um, in both the short stories and book, um, in many of the stories. And obviously um, in the book, not only was the main character a, uh, a musician, but was dating like a producer. And like, there was so much music mentioned And like you said, you grew up in the eighties and nineties. So there was a lot of like R and B and hip hop of that era. And our, our question is, um, if you had like a, a desert Island, like you can only bring like one or two albums with you, like what would they be? Wow. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, one of them would be, um, Brandy's album Full Moon. I'm a big Brandy fan and it's an amazing album. And then another one, because I want to like have some high energy. Um, oh, Beyonce, I have to say Beyonce's Renaissance because it just came out. I'm a huge fan of it. There you go. Um, I would say those two, because that's a good party album. <laughs> True. Although, Are you having a party on this day? I would be island? alone, right? Okay. Well, <laughs> well, I don't know. I like to party by myself too. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, curveball question. Um, when you wake up in the morning, do you remember your dreams? Yes. Uh, not all, but yeah, though usually the ones that are like I've just had in the morning. Yeah. 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 Do you have any recurring dreams that you can tell us about? No, I never do actually. They're always really? different. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I don't, I don't have any recurring ones either. Really? Karen, what is your recurring dream now? We need to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I have one frequently about this is, I can't believe I'm sharing this, but that all of my teeth have fallen out. And apparently well, it means, those. yeah. So I do have, I have had those, like they turn, they disintegrate. And I'm, yes. I'm it's like, yeah, there's a, I, that's, a are common, you guys okay? <laughs> no, that's like common. Cause I do, cause I always Google stuff when I think something like, yeah, apparently that's a common theme, but I can't remember what it means. It's supposed to mean something. So I looked it up recently too. And apparently it means that so you and I, Neil, feel like there's something in our life we don't have control over and it's stressing us. We're, we're losing control of something. <laughs> oh. I mean, I feel like I'm always out of control. So like... <laughs> exactly. I was like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> oh, my God. I hope I never have this dream. It sounds terrifying. I hope you don't either. <laughs> yeah. um, the next question is, what is the best compliment that you've ever received? Oh my God. Oh, well, I love when people compliment my food. I'm like, real. I'm a big foodie. And I actually considered culinary school at one point. Oh, cool. um, and so when people say my food is amazing, that makes me feel good. <laughs> yeah, there were reading those books. There is a lot of descriptions of delicious food. <laughs> you need to do like a like a Neil Patel companion cookbook of some of the yeah. recipes in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, next question. We have been asking people at Libro FM this and the answers always make us laugh. Either, okay, you can choose. Either what was your first job or what was your worst job? <laughs> or you can answer both as a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think like, oh, my worst job. Yeah, no, I know what my worst job was. <laughs> um, was at an accounting office in Beverly Hills when I first moved to LA and I, I joined the office during tax season, which oh, was God. the worst time to join because I'm somebody who likes to like do nothing at work and just like <laughs> be on Facebook and like look busy, but like, no, you actually had to do stuff. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and my, and the bosses, like the accountants were so stressed out. Like I was terrified. I, I would actually drink during my lunch break. Like I would go <laughs> down the street and have like two glasses of wine. Like and I got to calm back. down. <laughs> Yeah, I come back all relaxed. Like, hey, guys. <laughs> I think some of these stories are autobiographical. <laughs> yeah. <I know. laughs> 
<laughs> they, that's um, true. <laughs> yeah. That does sound like a terrible job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I will never do that job. I hate taxes. Um, cats or dogs and why? Dogs, because I feel like cats are shady and like, <laughs> <laughs> and like I'm shady and like, I don't think we would get along and like dogs are just so lovable. Like, I feel like, how can you feel bad about yourself when you have a dog? Cause like a dog just loves you unconditionally. So yeah, that's true. Yeah. If I go outside to like take the trash out and come back in, my dog acts as if I was like away at war. <laughs> like he's <laughs> like, you know, like. Uh. Yeah. And as a, a a host of two cats, a, a a roommate of two cats, I can confirm they are very shady. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, thanks for doing the the lightning round questions yeah. with us. That was fun. Yes. And um, so not not a lightning round question, a standard question, but uh, we are required to ask this for our own sakes and the sakes of all of our coworkers. Um, what are you reading or listening to or enjoying right now? Um, do you have any recommendations for for our listeners? Yeah, that's I. It's funny, like I always talk about things that I like, and then when someone asks me to recommend, that's when I forget everything. <laughs> yep. So <laughs> let me think for a second. Um, what did I read? Well, I really loved Leave the World Behind by Ramon Alam. Um, that was a really brilliant book. Um, I'm rereading um, Eileen by Otessa Moshfeg. I love that book. It's so dark and funny. Um, oh, uh, My Sister, the Serial Killer. Oh, yeah. Uh, Ink and Braithwaite. That's, that's such a... I love to see... I love things that are funny, too. Like, dark, but like funny yeah totally agreed well thank you so much for the time neil thank you we had a it was it was fun um i really enjoyed hearing about not only your process but also the kind of the funny desert island jokes and all that so yeah i am so excited i will rest easy knowing that there is another book on its way yes (laughs) thank you hopefully yeah we were wondering that it was like hard to find any information and we were talking like like yeah I hope it doesn't just do TV now. Like we need more books. <laughs> no, no, no. So. Definitely one more coming. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Well, we'll look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> All right. Thank you both. All right. Well, thank you for listening to our interview with Neil, everyone. Um, as always, Craig and I would like to chat a little bit about what we are reading. Um, maybe give you some ideas about what you can add to your TBR list. Craig, I know as we're recording this, we're towards the end of the year and you have confessed that you panic read to try to hit your quota. So I'm it's, curious. It's, I'm not <laughs> panic reading. <laughs> I, I'm just picking shorter books. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm not picking up any like epic fantasies right now. Oh, that that's, that's not, not true. <laughs> I was just going to say that's not actually true. Tell us, tell us what you're reading. <laughs> I am reading a couple of different things right now, but what I recently finished was True Biz by Sarah Novick. Um, absolutely loved it. It was our book club book at um, Libro. So you also just read it. So feel free to chime in with your thoughts. Um, I'm actually curious what you have to say about it as well, even though I know you loved it. Um, but it is a book that is from multiple perspectives and it's all centered around the school for the deaf. And it's from like the adults like the principal and from a couple of the different students and some of the parents and it's just super layered and a book unlike anything else i've ever read and we also had the author come and sit down with us and we got to ask a bunch of questions and have a really good conversation there so loved it what about you what did you think about it yeah i loved it too and i was really glad to have the print copy and the audiobook available to me because within the print copy, there are lots of visuals of ASL. And so it was very interesting to see how that was carried across into an audiobook. Um, I learned a lot. I thought it was very poignant. I loved it. Highly recommend. Yeah. The way the audiobook was done was so interesting. So for folks that haven't listened to it yet, um, when there's a deaf character who is signing, um, you can hear it on the audiobook, like you can hear their hands moving, which I found super interesting. I've never heard that in a book before. And when the author came, she explained like that process and all of that to us. And it was really, really interesting. So highly recommend going to get that. The other book that I'm reading, which is also awesome, is the Mistborn series by Brandon Sanderson. So I read the original Mistborn series, which is like three books. And then this is like 
technically part of the Mistborn series, but it's kind of in the future, different characters. So they call it book four or five and six, but it's, you don't necessarily have needed. No, you didn't have to read the first three really. Oh, okay. It's helpful because they do mention it and the, the magic system is the same. So you kind of need some of that information, but it's not like imperative. Like it's not picking up from where book three left off per se. Um, so when I said I wasn't reading an epic fantasy, I suppose I lied. Yeah. It, like these are like eight million pages long, right? No, they're long, but they're not crazy long. His other ones are ridiculous. Like, you know what I mean? Like they're heavy. Like, Door like stoppers. <laughs> yeah. Big time. Or, or life stoppers. You could kill someone with those books. <laughs> they're so big. Um, <laughs> these are, these are more manageable, okay. um, but also really good. So lovely. Yeah. What about you? What are you reading right now? I'm reading two books as well. I, uh, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I got my hands on an arc of the new Megan Abbott book that is coming out next year. It is called Beware the Woman. It is so good, Craig. So Megan Abbott, have you read any of her stuff? I don't know. I'm terrible with names. I always say, oh no, I haven't. And then I go look up who the author is. I'm like, oh yeah, I have. Um, all of them. I've read them all. She writes uh, She writes thrillers primarily. And she is an author who is on my like immediate purchase, no questions asked mm. list. So I was super stoked that she was coming out with a new book and I'm 80% of the way through it. It is so good. Um, it's about a young couple who have just gotten married and the wife is pregnant. They go to the UP in Michigan to the middle of nowhere to visit. Sorry, what what is the UP for people that don't live in Michigan? The Upper Peninsula. Oh, thanks. Is there a lower as well? The, the, the regular state of Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you. I'll show you a map of the mitten after this. Uh, wow! To, can't wait. Sounds to sounds issue. enthralling. <laughs> My God. So, <laughs> at any rate, they're kind of like in the middle of nowhere, and strange things start happening, and it's terrifying, and I love it. Uh, Ooh, so I'm I'm intrigued. I might have to. I might also have to go on NetGalley and and beg for this book. Although I haven't yeah. read it, I did quickly go on the internet, and I have not read anything by Megan Abbott. So I am oh. here for your. I guess for me and for anyone listening, if they've never read anything and they're going to pick up one to start, where where would you recommend we start? Oh, that's a good question. I would say You Will Know Me by Megan Abbott would be the one. Why are you saying it so spookily? I'm scared and Because now. it's a thriller. <laughs> I'm it's looking at the cover right book. now and it, it is spooky looking. <laughs> <laughs> I will head down to the Brookline Booksmith after we record and go pick this book up. It's so fun. I hope you enjoy it. On the next episode, I will let you know. I mean, I'll probably let you know before then, I guess. I'm kind of scared now. You're like, <laughs> hated it. Um, the other book I'm reading is very different. It's a middle grade reader and it's called Sisterhood of Sleuths. Mm, you've told so me about this cute. before. <laughs> and I, I gave my sister a copy of it too. And uh, it is just delightful. It's about a sixth grade girl who uh, kind of stumbles into a mystery via a box of Nancy Drew books that shows up at her home. This is, did you write this book? Is this book about you? <laughs> Autobiographical. Uh, I did not write this book, but it is so sweet. It's also illustrated um, and the illustrations are phenomenal. Um, very nice. pleasant, enjoyable read. I probably won't go get that one. It <laughs> I'm glad you're happy with it. It doesn't sound up my alley. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but I will definitely pick up the other one. Um, the audiobook is also fantastic of that as well. So you'll miss out on the illustrations, but the audio is delightful. Well, that was a fun way to, to end the podcast. Um, for folks who do not use Libro or haven't, or haven't got into it yet, if you use the code Libro podcast, you will get two credits when you sign up instead of one to use on any of the books we've mentioned or any books that are on your to be read list. That is correct. And as always, Craig and I would like to say thank you so much for listening. 